last but definitely not least, is our presenter, Danielle Mazur. Danielle grew up in a suburb of Chicago where she gained a robust and early interest in radical politics from her Slovenian grandmother, Vlasta, who was a proud member of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and a veteran of Josip Broz Tito's People Army in World War II. Sounds like someone I want to have a beer with. She originally, uh, Danielle originally came to Colombia to study music business, but changed her major to cultural studies in fall 2012. Danielle's academic interests include, but are not limited to, Marxism, critical pedagogy, disability studies, and postmodern philosophy. She's also worked as a summer camp counselor at Camp Pauls in Philadelphia, a camp for young adults with Down syndrome, an experience which has inspired much of her most recent work in cultural studies. She plans to present her paper at the Cultural Studies Association Conference next week, and then take a year off for travel, work, and applying to graduate school. The title of her presentation is Discipline in Bodies, Commodifying Education, Neoliberalism and the Instrumentalization of American Special Education Reform. In order to better understand issues surrounding public education in the neoliberal era of capitalism, Danielle Mazur critically investigates educational reform and reformism to reveal the contradictory market-based logic and instrumental rationality that informs and determines it. She argues that far from producing any progressive, democratic, and egalitarian forms and models of education, where the latter is seen as a public good, neoliberal educational reformism in fact reduces education to a commodity status, one that benefits educational industrialists and in the process reproduces the dominant social relations and class structures in society. Mazer focuses here on the, on special education and particularly on the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004, showing how the latter exemplifies these uh, contradictory neoliberal logics and rationalities. She takes issue with the act's essentialist presuppositions about disability as other and claims that these reproduce the idealized subjects of neoliberal capitalism as autonomous entrepreneurial individual. Not only that, the project also engages the work of contemporary critical pedagogy studies, pointing to some of its limitations and also urging radical educators to imagine a new educational institution, one that is divorced from the confines of the neoliberal educational structures and one that is grounded on the notion that learning is a social process that should adapt to the needs of students of all abilities and capabilities. Danielle Mazur. So my project does many things, but I'm just going to keep the focus a little bit more narrow today. Um, so in order to better understand issues surrounding public education in the neoliberal era of capitalism, my project critically approaches education reform as an event that illustrates the underlying market-based logic of the U.S. public education system, which reduces education to a commodity status. In particular, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004 exemplifies these neoliberal logics, as well as reveals essentialized presuppositions about disability as other, while reproducing the idealized subject of neoliberal capitalism as the autonomous entrepreneurial individual. In the U.S., special education programs for children with disabilities grew out of several major historical formations, beginning with European Enlightenment movements. Developments in specialized pedagogy in modern educational institutions are inseparable from major shifts in Western thought and their presuppositions about disability. Knowledge about non-normative bodies grew out of European Enlightenment culture and the belief in the perfectibility of nature through culture. Modern institutional isolation of social deviance produced a space in which individual bodies could be inspected, evaluated, rehabil and rehabilitated by a flourishing economy of professional medical practitioners operating on the logic of scientific ra rationality, hoping to empirically prove natural causes for insanity and idiocy. These institutions would serve as curative spaces for dis uh, people with bodily differences to adapt um, to adapt to social norms and or custodial spaces to make difference invisible from normative society. 
these European Enlightenment practices carried into the progressive era in the US, especially in the notion that he, the human condition and society could be perfected by a scientific rationality. This logic influenced the development of specialized educational practices as well as the early administrative practices of American public schools. The same biological and social determinist philosophy that penetrated early American educational institutions also legitimized eugenic practices in the early 20th century. In their book, Cultural Locations of Disability, Sharon L. Snyder and David T. Mitchell trace the construction of biological inferiority and deviance back to Western eugenics. American eugenics, sorry, quote, American eugenics laid bare the social and national goals newly claimed for medical practice practices. It promised an empirically sound cross-disciplinary arena for identifying defectives, viewed as a threat to the purity of a modern nation state. Turn of the century diagnosticians came to rely on the value of bureaucratic surveillance tools such as consensus data, medical catalogs, and intelligence testing, end quote. Traces of the surveillance of populations in order to detect social threats and or risks are found in the disciplinary techniques of social administrative agencies and their exercise of power over the populations they are, in theory, supposed to serve, including education. Disability rights in the US have largely been asserted by the deployment of a minority model of disability after the legal gains of the civil rights movement. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of, of uh, 1975, originally titled the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, was the first U.S. federal law ensuring that children with disabilities had access to an education in public schools. The law holds states and local education agencies accountable for providing students with disabilities a free and appropriate uh, public education that emphasizes special education and related services, an individualized education plan, and the right to due process. The construction of bodily abnormality within the IDEA produces a problematic deficit model of disability. Disability scholar Jackie Lee Scully notes how biomedical science attempts to organize the unruly nature of individual bodies. Quote, biomedical science profoundly shapes our assumptions about what a normal body is, how it should behave and when a body or a bodily change is threatening and what the natural limitations of the body are. The dominance of biomedicine obscures the way that the body can be interpreted in a multiplicity of ways, end quote. Echoing the curative notions of enlightenment institutional practices, the IDA not only offers a pathological definition of students with disabilities based on a physiological evaluation, but in order to qualify for benefits, a student's special education and or related service eligibility depends on demonstrating that their disability adversely affects their academic ability. Scully goes on to emphasize the ethical implications of biomedicine and its humanist assumptions. Quote, the enlightened ideal of reason drew on continued notions of what constitutes a person, where autonomy and rationality became the key objective standards of the assignment of personhood to decide what makes someone a subject and how a subject behaves as a moral agent. Only the autonomous, rational, self-aware subject is capable of making reasoned moral choices that are coherent with the framework of the accepted system of values." End quote. Therefore, a biomedical understanding of disability constructs the disabled body as one which exists outside the rational, autonomous, idealized subject, such as the subject of right. Therefore, students who qualify and claim benefits under the IDEA are essentialized as other. The act dictates that a child with a disability is only eligible for special education and related services if the child's disability adversely affects their performance. This medicalized understanding of disability is frequently used to legitimize exclusionary practices of students. Students with disabilities are then included in the general education classroom so long as they conform to the normative standards of that environment. On the whole, inclusion remains the ideal only so long as the cost to include a student with a disability in the general education classroom is relatively inexpensive. The state of public education, of the public education system in the US at the present historical conjuncture reflects several of the dominant shifts in political in the political economic order during the latter half of the 20th century. 
U.S. federal law and policy have served as a state apparatus which organizes public in educational institutions from monetary funding to specific uh, regulatory conduct principles. The reauthorization of the IDEA in 2004, which aligned the act with the principles of No Child Left Behind, reflects the underlying neoliberal logic of the American education system, which undermines the original purposes of the act. Market-based education reforms began to gain support in the U.S. in 1983 when the National Commission on Excellence in Education, backed by the Reagan administration, published A Nation at Risk. This report claimed that American schools were undermining the U.S.'s competitive position in the global marketplace. This manufactured crisis fueled the neoliberal education agenda, which has been marketed to the public under the guise of accountability, standards, adequacy, and excellence up to the present, denying any claim to education as a public good, as in previous decades. This movement, which ignored previous national concerns about educational equality, culminated in the Bush administration's No Child Left Behind of 2001. No Child Left Behind forced public schools into competition by in implementing high-stakes testing, charter schools, and teacher accountability based on standardized test results. This has led to a universalized vision of educational standards that all students can and must work to achieve, as well as a systematic demoralization of the work of teachers. This contradicts the purpose, this contradicts the original purpose of the individualized education plan, which provides a framework for educators to adapt their instruction to the needs and goals of students with, uh, for students with disabilities, an ideally learner-centered approach, which is known as one of the most effective portions. Market-based education practices that force schools to compete with one another based on standardized test results transform students' academic performance results into information commodities, human capital, for the purposes of exchange. As a result, quote, students deemed to be disruptive will be valued least of all in such a system because these students both cost more to educate and interfere with the education, i.e. test scores, of other students. This has led to exclusionary practices of students with disabilities, particularly by charter schools, because they are required to maintain a certain level of test scores in order to maintain their charter status. Disability scholars Dudley, Marling, and Baker voice, uh, voice concern over privatization initiatives in special education and claim, in a system where the survival of schools and the jobs of teachers depend on ever higher test scores or worse, students who threaten the scores of other students by consuming a disproportionate share of scarce resources, including teacher attention, will be unwelcome. So in the neoliberal era of capitalism, general K through 12 education is no longer in the eyes of the state a public good. It is rather a potentially profitable market for private corporations to exploit. The neoliberal state uses its power to support the reproduction of capital by investing in the opening of new potential markets for education corporations such as Pearson and McGraw-Hill. At the present historical conjuncture, the U.S. education system operates by an instrumental market-based logic and no longer reflects the notion of education as a public good that benefits all. As some of you may have recently heard, the neoliberal education initiative known as the Common Core has received nationwide backlash from parents, students, and educators refusing to administer standardized exams. It is my hope that critical pedagogy, <laughs> critical pedagogy could <laughs> be the answer to our education concerns. Critical pedagogy is concerned with contemporary neoliberal educational practices that marginalize individuals with or without disabilities. Theorists view schools as a space of possibility as well as a space which frequently reproduces problematic dominant ideologies. Henry Giraud and Peter McLaren express, in the, uh, express the potential of critical pedagogy in claiming, quote, critical educational theory begins with the assumption that schools are essential sites for organizing knowledge, power, and desire in the service of extending individual and social possibilities. This would require a learning environment that would not make any student into an other by all means necessary. Shiro and McLaren, in their introductory chapter to Critical Pedagogy, the State, and Cultural Struggle, voice concern over the ways in which the state organizes policy reform around an idealized standard 
student by creating specialized programs for students who exist on the margins of standard. Quote, the perspective that disadvantaged students could be the focus of special, edu uh, special programs to remediate their deficiencies is in many respects as impoverishing and debilitating as the social and economic circumstances of which they are perennial victims since it impresses upon the disenfranchised that it is their personal shortcomings as minority or economically disadvantaged groups which prevent them from joining the elite tracks that lead to university life and a better future. Giraud and McLaren, without explicitly stating it, are concerned with the neoliberal logic of education which attempts to place failure upon individuals and remove any liability for the shortcomings of the neoliberal state to provide the means for a quality education for all students at any given level. It is my hope that rather than taking traditional reformist approaches to improving education, radical educators can take this opportunity of weakness in the neoliberal regime to imagine an educational institution divorced from the control of private capital and the instrumental market logic of the neoliberal capitalist state. In the hopes, or I would also hope, a more democratic educational structure uh, would view learning as a social process that is capable of including students of all abilities and may adapt to their educational desires as well as needs. Thank you.